All right, welcome everyone. Uh, this is Gillen Wood. I'm the Associate Director for Education and Outreach at the Institute for Sustainability, Energy and Environment here on campus. I'd uh, like to welcome you to the second in our three-part fall lecture series entitled Where Stuff Comes From, Earth Resources and Sustainability. We're lucky enough to have the expertise of Professor Emeritus Steve Marshak to uh, illuminate these subjects for us. He was on the faculty at the University of Illinois for 35 years. He served as head of the geology department and also head of the School of Earth Society and Environment. Uh, he is uh, the author of numerous papers and books on geology uh, and uh, award-winning textbooks that have passed through the hands of many, many thousands of undergraduates across the United States in the past several decades. We're lucky to have him here for the second of his three lectures. This one entitled Precious Stuff, the discovery, extraction, and use of valuable minerals from gems to smartphones. So thank you, Steve. Well, thanks very much. Um, welcome to the, the second one of these, these lectures. Um, got a lot of ground to cover today, so I'm gonna launch right into it. Um, basically, what we're gonna be talking about today are, are uh, materials from the earth that people find valuable. And valuable can mean either um, they're precious in the sense of, of gemstones and gold, or they're valuable because they are, are key elements of, of modern technology or even traditional technology. Now, it's a huge topic. Um, you know, in general, this, this subject would be the subject of a two semester course. And so there's clearly no way I can get through everything. So I'll, I'll try to, to touch on many key topics, but um, please realize that, that uh, this is just a, a brief introduction and the, the subject as a whole is, is a much larger one. Basically what I'm gonna try to do today is start by just giving a really quick rundown for any of you who have, or many of you who have not had any geological background as to what minerals rocks are. Um, and then we're gonna focus in on, on gems and minerals. And if there's time at the end, or actually I should say gems and metallic deposits. And then if there's any time at the end, I'll, I'll try to get into a little bit about lithium, which is a key element that we're using today. So first of all, what is a mineral? Well, to a geologist, a mineral is a naturally occurring, gen generally inorganic crystalline solid that has a definable chemical composition. So basically, it's, it's uh, easy to think about what is not a mineral. So for example, oil is not a mineral because it, it uh, is a liquid. Sugar is not a mineral because it's an organic chemical that comes out of, of uh, um, organic materials. But quartz is a mineral. Um, one of the key definitions, key components of the definition of a mineral is that it has an orderly internal structure, a crystalline structure. So for example, symbolically on the left, inside a quartz crystal, the atoms are arranged in a nice regular arrangement, like the scaffolding on the, on the Washington Monument when it was under construction or under reconstruction. A glass, on the other hand, is something that's got a chaotic arrangement of atoms inside. So even when you see something that's called crystal, like these crystal pictures or this crystal bowl, um, it's actually not a crystal because um, the material inside is a chaotic structure or chaotic arrangement of atoms. Now, um, getting back to what real minerals are, uh, some minerals have very distinct, or all minerals really have very distinct physical properties. So for example, if we take a sample of galena, which is a, a mineral ore um, composed of lead and sulfur, it has a metallic luster, it's very dense, it's got a sort of grayish color, it has a certain hardness. Cleavage refers to the way it breaks apart. You'll notice that there are all sorts of, of uh, um, ir, uh, right angle edges on it because of its crystal structure, and then it has a crystal habit. Um, now, minerals, for our purposes, we're going to look at a subset of minerals. Um, they can form in a number of ways. For example, some minerals form by um, precipitation out of a water solution. Some form by the solidification of a melt. Uh, some form by the cementation of, of grains, and some form by the, the movement of atoms inside a solid. So let's look at a, a, a quick example. Here's an example of a, a mineral precipitating from a water solution. Start out with some smaller crystals. Over time, they get bigger and bigger because what's happening is the uh, atoms are coming out of solution and attaching to the crystal face. Here's an example of, of a mineral, amethyst, that forms by precipitation from water inside open spaces that form originally as air bubbles in, in a basaltic lava down in, in Brazil. 
You can see the crystals are just growing inward from the wall and have a very specific shape, the crystal habit that's developing. Um, in another case, there are minerals that precipitate out of, out of salty water. Uh, we, we looked at these, I think, last week, or last time I gave one of these lectures. Here's an example of, of uh, the evaporite at the floor of Death Valley. And in, in what, what we're seeing here are salt crystals that are precipitating out of a liquid that evaporated away. Um, and then I mentioned that some crystals form by solidification of a melt. So if you imagine this is not water solution, but actually igneous melt, molten rock coming out of a lava or coming out of a volcano, the crystals as the melt cools gradually get larger and larger and eventually interlock with one another to form a, a fabric of, of uh, crystalline rock. Uh, here's an example of where it's happening in real time. Here's a, a lava flow coming out of a Hawaiian volcano many, many years ago. And uh, the red part is still molten. The gray part has turned into solid. And within that, we're seeing crystals that are growing um, by, the, by the solidification of a melt. The final type is probably the, the least familiar. And these are crystals that form by a process called solid state diffusion. And what that means is that inside a solid, at temperatures that are less than the melting temperature, uh, atoms just naturally have motion. And over time, they will rearrange with each other. So these orange atoms are switching places with some of these gray atoms. And if that happens over a long enough time, you can actually form new minerals entirely by this process, which is called solid state diffusion. So for example, um, here's a block of rock from a, from a place called Gore Mountain in upstate New York. And what you're seeing here are gigantic garnets. Here's a, a quarter for scale. Garnet, when it's very pure and clear, is a gemstone, but it's, it's used here. Uh, these are not clear and, and, and um, um, gem quality. So these are being used to be crushed up and made into an abrasive because garnet is a very hard material. Um, but they're basically formed by solid state diffusion where the elements that make the garnet are coming out of the surrounding rock and crystallizing a garnet in the solid state. Well, just to conclude, there are a variety of, of different kinds of minerals. Uh, geologists classify them on the basis of chemical composition. So we talk about silicates and carbonates and oxides. Most minerals on the planet are silicates formed by a combination of silicon, oxygen, and other atoms. Uh, limestones can, can contain the mineral calcite and then many ore deposits, the ones that are useful for people, um, for metals to extract metals from, include oxides, sulfides, and, and others, because these tend to have a relatively high concentration of metal compared to um, other minerals, like either oxygen or sulfur. And it turns out it's fairly easy to extract the metal from those materials and, and turn them into useful materials. Now, briefly speaking, um, we mentioned minerals. Well, rocks are basically naturally occurring uh, coherent aggregates of minerals. So for example, if you see a, a rock outcrop like here in, in Joshua Tree National Monument, look closely at the material, what you're seeing are lots of different kinds of minerals, but they're all interlocking and stuck together to form a solid coherent material, a rock. Uh, geologists, you probably know this, but just in case, um, recognize three different kinds of, igne of rocks. Igneous ones are derived from solidified molten rock, uh, sometimes they come out of a volcano, sometimes they solidify underground. We'll see these are pretty important for many of the uh, economic materials that we're going to be looking at. Sedimentary rocks are ones that are formed from cemented together grains that can either be eroded from previous rock or precipitated from water solutions or formed by cementation of shells together. And finally, metamorphic rocks are ones that change in the solid state where the solid state diffusion process that I mentioned a few minutes ago uh, forms new minerals and new textures. So very quickly, igneous rocks, either they form by solidification down underground when a magma chamber cools, or they form when magma erupts at the surface, either as a lava flow or in some cases as ash. Um, if you've ever been to the Sierra Nevada mountains in, in California, you can see vast areas of igneous rocks, granites, that form by intrusion underground and then solidification. And the overlying volcanoes and everything that were once above the ground have eroded away entirely. So now we're seeing materials that were once many, many kilometers below the surface of the earth exposed by erosion. Uh, here's an example of, of salt again back in Death Valley where these salt pans, you're precipitating out salt crystals directly from water. 
And then here's an example of sedimentary rocks that are deposited when grains of sand or grains of mud accumulate layer after layer after layer over time, and then eventually get compacted and underground turned into rock. That process of forming sedimentary rocks can occur in a variety of different environments, ranging from the coast to sand dunes to deep water environments, forming lots of different kinds of, of sedimentary rocks. The final type, metamorphic rocks, uh, form in a number of places, but most of them form where rock that was once at the surface gets carried down at depth, where it gets subjected to higher pressures and temperatures, undergoing a transition that changes the minerals into new crystalline materials. Uh, often this, oops, I'm sorry. Often that happens deep underground beneath mountain belts. So at the surface where mountains are forming, you can imagine that 10, 20, 30 kilometers beneath uh, metamorphic rocks are forming. And uh, you can see that the rocks are actually pretty soft at the time that they're developing so that they can develop these very complicated structures like this rock exposed on a hillside in Scotland. Okay, so now we know what a mineral is, we know what a rock is, and now we can talk about extracting valuable resources from those. Now, when we talk about extracting valuable resources, there are many, many factors that, take into, that must be taken into account in determining whether or not a particular resource of rock or a particular uh, accumulation of minerals is something that's economic and worth extracting or not. Uh, for one thing, they, they, it depends on where they are. For example, are they close to markets because transportation of these materials can cost a lot? Is the area where the ore deposit occurs politically stable? Um, is the country that they're in friendly to us or not? If we're talking about minerals that are coming into the United States. Then, of course, there are practical uh, issues to take into account, the ease and cost of extraction, the ease and cost of processing, and then, of course, I mentioned already, transportation. And one of the main things that goes into uh, the, the cost has to do with regulations. Are there regulations governing the environmental footprint of, of extraction of minerals? Um, obviously, environmental regulations are important for us, but they, of course, add costs. And then finally, a big issue is, are they renewable or non-renewable? In the sense of, is the supply something that's being formed? In general, not for our cases. So in, in usual cases of, of economic mineral deposits, we're talking about stuff that's non-renewable. So that means that, that this material, um, once it's extracted, it's been extracted. So if we ever want to reuse it, it's going to be a situation where we're going to have to recycle the material rather than find new stuff. And this comes into play a lot now because most of the materials that we use are non-renewable. So therefore there are sustainability issues involved in whether or not we're gonna be able to have enough supply to sustain our lifestyle in the future. So again, emphasize these last two points. We'll see that there's an environmental consequence to the extraction, production and use of materials. They can cause pollution, uh, damage the land. And in many cases they're producing, um, they have a carbon footprint. Then of course, there's the sustainability issue, which is the ability of society to maintain or improve its standard of living without destroying the environment. Um, and that's not always the case with economic materials. Okay, so let's uh, get away from the introduction and jump into the study of, of gems. Um, I, I promised today to talk about precious stuff. So let's start with one kind of precious stuff, gems. Um, what is a gem? Well, a gem is a kind of mineral that happens to be particularly pretty. And it happens to be particularly pretty either because of its transparency or its color, its lack of inclusions. Uh, it's the stuff that you want to put into jewels and, and uh, crowns and other kinds of, of valuable things. Now, turns out that, that uh, many gems are simply special versions of standard minerals. So for example, um, an aluminosilicate mineral called that contains beryllium has a chemical formula, beryllium aluminum silicate. Um, it's called beryl. And beryl itself is not necessarily a very pretty mineral. But in some cases, beryl will be very clear. And in that case, it's called emerald. Um, where do these materials occur? Well, a lot of, of particularly valuable gemstones occur in a particular type of igneous rock. Remember, these are rocks formed originally from melts that are called pegmatites. Now, pegmatites are actually kind of funny igneous rocks. They're very steamy in the sense that they have, they're, they're actually a sort of borderline between a, a very hot water solution in water and an igneous material. And so what happens is they're kind of 
um, garbage collectors for all the elements that don't like to get incorporated in other minerals. Beryllium doesn't. So beryllium ends up in this last phase of steamy melt that finally intrudes and, and solidifies in big dikes like, like these ones that we're seeing here. A dike is an intrusion of igneous rock in a sort of sheet-like form that cuts across other layers. Now, if you take a pegmatite dike, um, if it's weathered a little bit, easy to crush up and crush it, you can extract lots and lots of emeralds from it. So here's a plate full of emeralds. Now, these aren't particularly high quality emeralds. My wife is holding this, this plate. We were visiting a, a mine in Brazil. Uh, if they were, they'd be worth $3,000 a carat, and this would be a sort of priceless plate. But as it was, it was just something in a gem store. So the question then becomes like, all right, you get minerals that are, are uh, coming out of the ground. Some people have the impression that they are in the gem form that you go to a jewelry store and buy, but that's not the case. In general, or in all cases, what you find in the ground is, is an uncut, uh, non-faceted gemstone. The, the facets that you see when you see a gem, they're not the crystal faces, nor are they cleavage faces. Cleavage is a word that geologists use for the natural fractures that occur in rock. So they have to be manufactured. And the way they're done is, is they're not cut. We, we often, you may have heard the term cutting a gem. It's actually not cutting it in the sense that you cut cheese with a knife. What, what's happening is that they are faceted by grinding them against a spinning plate or a lap that is covered with um, a grit of very hard powdered material and water. And as this spins, it grinds away the surface of the gem and produces one of the faces. So cutting actually means grinding away using a rotating lap on which there's a powdered abrasive and water. So here's a, an old style lap where somebody's cutting a gemstone by hand. Modern ones are, are more sophisticated. They have a very complicated device called a, a doping stick that's connected to a, 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 a device that determines the angle, precise angle at which the, the gem is being cut. And the result is that you can create very, very complicated cuts. And when you go to a jewelry store, what you're getting is a cut stone, such as this brilliant cut diamond, where each one of these faces was cut by um, grinding it against a lap for a certain period of time. So this particular cut is, is a design that's called a brilliant cut. It's got 57 facets. It was designed actually only about 100 years ago. And it's characteristic of that it has the maximum return of light to the surface. And that's what gives the gem its fire that people, or a diamond, for example, its fire, um, which makes them so appealing, which is why people will wear diamonds on their fingers rather than just pieces of glass. Each surface has a name. And basically, you're losing a lot of the material during the process. But of course, the crushed up diamond that's taken can then be used to grind away to produce other diamonds. So it's not, not just thrown out. There are lots of different cuts that people make during faceting. There's the emerald cut, the round cut, the pear cut, the radiant cut. Uh, depends what kind of look you want. In any case, once these stones have been cut, um, they become valuable gems. And probably the most valuable, at least in, in popular culture, are diamonds. Uh, here's the hope diamond, a, a blue stone. The blue color in, in the hope diamond comes from some impurities that are within the diamond um, and surrounded by clear diamonds. And here's uh, Queen Elizabeth with diamonds on her head. Um, they're, they're, they're precious. But where does diamond come from? So let's focus in on diamonds in particular. Well, diamonds are actually composed of carbon. And carbon is, is pretty common at the surface of the earth. Your, your body's got a lot of carbon in it. Any kind of plant material has a lot of carbon in it. And if you take plant material and bury it over long periods of time, then bury it deeply in the earth, the weight of the overlying rock and the heat and pressure that it's subjected to will turn it into coal, which is almost pure carbon, not completely pure, pure carbon. But in sedimentary rock conditions, coal is just another sedimentary rock that instead of being formed by sand, it's formed from, from plant material that's been packed together and then various uh, gaseous components that were within the plant material escape, like ammonia, hydrogen, other kinds of things, and you're left with pretty much pure carbon. Now, if you take that pure carbon and bury it even deeper into metamorphic conditions, like tens of kilometers beneath the surface of the earth, the, the, all the other elements except for carbon escape 
and you're left with pure carbon, which arranges it to a very unusual crystal structure that produces a mineral called graphite. Now you've used graphite uh, in an everyday experience by writing on a piece of paper with a, with a pencil because the, the so-called lead in a pencil is not actually lead, it's graphite. And the reason it works as a pencil is that when you run the pencil across a surface, little flakes of graphite come, come off and stay on the piece of paper because graphite is a very flaky material because it has very strong bonds in, in the plane of the material, but very weak bonds between the planes. So it just peels off to form little flakes on the surface of a piece of paper. Now, if you take graphite and take it down to 150 kilometers or so, which is below the surface of the, uh, below the crust of the earth, but deep down into sort of mantle conditions, the, the graphite rearranges so that it has no weak bonds at all. All the bonds are very strong and it forms this unusual octahedral mineral called diamond. Diamond is the hardest mineral known to, to humanity because of the way the bonds hold the carbon atoms together within it. It's very, very hard. And it's also in a, in a pure form, clear. So if you're familiar with a phase diagram in chemistry where tem temperature increases on this axis, pressure increases on this axis, Graphite occurs down here, liquid occurs at higher temperatures, and under these very, very high pressures, diamond forms. Now, how do you get carbon, something that, that is occurring in plants or other organisms at the surface of the earth, down to the depths where they can turn into diamond? Well, there's actually carbon inside the earth, and some of the diamond that forms may come from carbon that's coming from inside the earth. Turns out uh, some of it also comes from the process of subduction. I think um, in, in, I'm trying to remember if I discussed it in the last class, but you may remember that the surface or the outer layer of the earth is broken into a number of discrete pieces called plates and that these plates move constantly with respect to one another. And in some cases, ocean floor plates sink back down into the earth's interior at places called subduction zones. Uh, like along the Western margin of the Andes, the Pacific ocean floor is sinking back down and going in, into the earth it carries with it carbon that was in the sediments. And when that carbon gets carried down to great depths, it turns into diamond. Well, the next question to ask is, if it gets carried down to great depths, how does it get back up to the surface? Well, it turns out that at these great depths, you can have melting of the material and some of the diamonds that have formed get carried up with special kinds of belt and they get erupted or they get injected, I should say, or intruded near the surface of the earth and solidify to form igneous rocks. So there are special places where there are features called diamond pipes, which are filled with a rock called kimberlite, which contains what are called xenoliths, foreign bodies of diamonds that have been carried up from the mantle and intruded into the upper crust of the earth. So these are special places where you get diamond pipes and that's how diamonds are brought back to the surface of the earth and that's where the diamonds that, that uh, people collect to make gemstones originated from. Now, in a, in a kimberlite, this is a block of kimberlite, this is what a diamond looks like. It's embedded as a clear stone within a kimberlite. And here's another example of one. Now, these kimberlites are sort of long, columnar-shaped intrusions. So to extract them, people dig uh, diamond mines that dig down into them um, that are fairly narrow in diameter and very deep vertically. This one's filled up with water. It, it's run out of ore or the ore is now so deep that it can't be extracted. And so it's been allowed to fill with water. Here's some active mines for extraction of diamond that are going after kimberlites that intruded way north up in, in Arctic Canada, an area that normally just looks like this. Turns out that underneath some of these lakes, are diamonds and people have, have uh, dug these very deep mines. What you're seeing here are the mines themselves. And then this area in here to the right, I, I'm hoping you can see my pointer, is where the, the tailings, the, the waste rock from these pits is being spread out over the land surface. And this is the processing plant over here. This is a very remote area, um, nowhere near where anybody lives, um, but you can see it's affecting the landscape of the tundra quite severely. Here's a place in South Africa, a diamond mine. This is the, this is the, the 
the road along which the trucks carry the ore out. And here's a town that's been built nearby. Uh, in some cases, the diamonds are so deep that, that it's not possible to extract them in an open pit like that. Instead, they are mined underground and then brought up in elevators or brought up in, in, the, in, in underground um, access routes. Now, not all diamonds come from these underground mines. In fact, uh, many of them are formed where over geologic time, the diamond pipe has weathered, meaning it has reacted by uh, chemical reactions with air and water, has weathered away and produced loose sediment that then has been eroded and carried away by streams and deposited somewhere else. The debris, debris produced by this erosion is called alluvium. Any kind of debris produced by erosion um, and then deposited is called alluvium if it's deposited by a river. Now, the diamonds are very hard and very resistant. So while all the other minerals in the kimberlite turn into clay and wash away, um, the diamond stays behind and mixes with other kinds of sediments, sand and gravel, to produce a sedimentary deposit. So to get the diamonds out of these deposits involves basically panning. And it can be done by hand like these guys are doing here, or it can be done um, using a, a diamond dredge where you dredge it up and then run it through screens and separate out the diamonds. So we've seen that, that, that now that diamonds can be mined by hard rock mining in a kimberlite pipe, or they can be mined by panning sediment that's been derived by the erosion of kimberlite. And in some cases, ancient millions or even billions of years ago, diamond containing sediment was deposited in layers. And so you can mine sedimentary rocks that contain the diamonds. And here's a sedimentary rock deposit uh, in Brazil that, that contained um, diamonds and then was mined, oh, decades ago, maybe centuries, uh, a century ago in the town, near a town called Diamantina, Brazilian or Portuguese for diamonds. When you extract the diamonds from, from uh, alluvium, they look like this. Some of them have the crystal structure, the octahedral crystal structure characteristic of diamonds, and some are just irregular because they banged against each other and have broken apart. But again, if you take those stones and cut them with a fastening machine, you make cut stones or gem quality diamonds. Now, diamonds, of course, are, are extremely expensive if you've ever gone to a jewelry store and looked at the prices in the window. But they're actually not as rare as their cost suggests. It turns out that the reason that they're so expensive is because they're held in huge stockpiles and vaults. And they're only divvied out in relatively small quanti quantities so that the pr price is controlled. Now, this, this cost was largely a consequence of, of De Beers, which was a company founded by Cecil Rhodes back in 1888, Cecil Rhodes and Rhodes Scholarships. And for most of the 20th century, De Beers controlled 80% of the diamond trade. And in fact, in the 1980s, it was controlling up to 90% of the diamond trade. So talk about monopoly. De Beers had a monopoly on diamonds and they kept this, the price stable by stockpiling the dot diamonds when the market was slow and then releasing them when the market went up a little bit. Also, they, they had an incredible advertising call campaign, Diamonds Are Forever, which basically made diamonds seem like something everybody wanted to buy. And uh, going way back, um, Diamonds Are Forever was, was their brilliant marketing ploy, which added value to the diamonds. So by monopolizing the, the, the supply and marketing them very, very brilliantly, um, they ended up creating a value that, that has lasted to, to today. Of course, uh, De Beers doesn't really exist in the same way anymore because other countries, first Russia and then Canada, broke away and started uh, um, competing. And finally, De Beers sold off most of its stockpile in the 2000s and it controls less than about 40% of the market today. And other big players are, are Russia, uh, BHP, other companies. But diamonds are still very localized. The, the market's very concentra uh, concentrated. So Antwerp in, in, um, in Belgium has the largest share. And there are only about 28 uh, diamond exchanges around the world, which still control the rate of re release and therefore control the price. Um, but in 2014, I haven't updated this, about $130 billion worth of diamonds were being sold. Now, one thing about diamonds is, is because of their value, 
uh, there are unfortunately blood diamonds or conflict diamonds available. And these are produced by rebel groups in, in, as opposed to parts of official nations. Uh, in some cases, they are produced by slave labor or by, by thievery. They're fenced through legitimate markets. And so to try to stop this, the United Nations a number of years ago uh, created what's called the Kimberley process, which requires certification as conflict-free diamonds. And now uh, the World Diamond Council, an organization, that, an organization that controls the diamond trade uh, or monitors it, thinks that the diamond trade is now about 99% conflict-free. Are there alternatives to diamonds? Well, yeah, actually, um, there is synthetic diamond because basically all you got to do is take carbon and squeeze it under the proper pressure temperature conditions and you produce diamond. So they were first produced uh, industrially in 1955 um, and they could be produced. And so there are synthetic diamonds. Um, it's now possible to actually produce them by chemical vapor deposition. So uh, um, alternatives to, to natural diamonds exist. Um, and also there are alternatives like cubic zirconia, which is vastly less expensive, um, can be uh, a, a, a replacement for, for diamonds and jewelry. Now, when you think of diamonds, they're not all beautiful gems like what we've just looked at. Some are industrial grade, which are used primarily as grits for grinding away other materials. Um, so what makes a diamond valuable are, are what the gem cutters will call the four C's, the size, which is carat, which is basically 0.2 grams, the cut, uh, how, how well it's been faceted because that affects the fire of the stone, the color, um, how transparent it is, or if it's a colored stone, how rich the hue, and the clarity, which refers to the lack of inclusions, which are little um, tiny fragments of other materials that are embedded within the diamonds, which are actually very interesting to geologists because geologists can use these inclusions to understand the nature of, of what the mantle um, of the earth is composed of. So anyways, uh, diamonds, of course, come in very, very various sizes. Um, and the value, if you go to a typical jewelry store, is going to depend on the size and, the, and the, the quality of the stone. And now they're, they're just a worldwide exchange for, for trading diamonds. OK, so we've talked about rocks and minerals. Uh, we've talked about gems. Now let's jump into metals. First of all, what is a metal? metal? Then we're going to talk about uh, uh, the process of, abstract, of extracting them in general, and we will also discuss gold in particular. So a metal, um, something special about metals is that they're malleable, meaning they can be hammered into sheets or stretched into wire. Um, that's because they're held together by me metallic bonds, which are different from the kinds of bonds, say, in a diamond or in graphite, because the electrons that are in the outer shells of the atoms are free to move. And so that's why um, metals make good electrical conductors. Now, when we say malleable, um, you can imagine taking a nugget of gold that's only 0.5 centimeters and hammering it into a sheet like this that's, that's 0.7 meters by 0.7 meters. So uh, basically, um, they're extremely, that, that's why you can make gold foil for decorating uh, wood is you're taking a very, very small quantity of gold and flattening it into an extremely broad sheet. Copper, uh, you can imagine stretching it into wires, flattening it into coins. That's what the malleable component of, of or the malleable characteristic of, of metals is. Now, metals come from ore deposits. So what's an ore deposit? Well, first of all, let's define an ore mineral. An ore mineral is a mineral that contains a relatively high proportion of a valuable metal in an extractable form. Now, to get a sense of that, well, let me say, define one more thing. An ore is a rock that contains an economic quantity of a valuable metal. In other words, it contains enough ore minerals that it can be extracted and a profit can be made. Basically, all of these materials are, are materials that are defined as such because of the ability to extract what you want from the rock um, and make a profit. So, how do, you, how do you understand that difference? Well, let's imagine something like iron. Iron occurs in many, many minerals. So for example, if you were to take just a random piece of granite, like the, the rock that's in, a, in the, the stones that are around the alma mater statue on campus, the iron oxide minerals are a very, very small quantity of the rock, that rock. The other minerals account for most of it. 
So yes, you could extract iron from granite, but it would cost a fortune to do so, and it's just not economic. So instead, you'll if you want to extract iron, you go to a rock like this. This is iron ore from, from uh, northern Michigan, which is composed mostly of iron oxide minerals and relatively little silicate minerals. And so it's possible to crush up this rock, extract the iron, and actually, in general, if the price of iron is, is relatively high and the concentration of this is pretty high, you can make a profit off of it. So that makes it an economic mineral. Now, how do you get these concentrations of, of economic minerals? There are lots of ways, and I can't go through all of them, but one way is, is what's called magmatic deposits. And this is when you have an igneous rock being intruded and you end up getting concentrations of sulfide ores because those particular minerals are very dense. They accumulate together. Sometimes they settle down to the bottom of the magma chamber, sometimes within the magma chamber. So those are called magmatic deposits. Um, in many cases, the ores are concentrated not by settling out of the melt, but because when you intrude magma, it sets up convective circulation involving water that's coming originally from rain has seeped into ground and starts circulating through the rock. Now, when this water comes in and circulates, it gets hot, it dissolves the metals, and then when it cools down, it precipitates the metals, metals in concentrations. So in some plutons, pluton meaning a, a blob-shaped body of igneous rock, you can get either a disseminated deposit, which means the, the ore minerals are disseminated or distributed throughout the rock, or you can get vein minerals, where the ore minerals mixed with water solutions and then precipitated in cracks. And when you get a, a mineral-filled crack, that's called a vein. Okay, so once again, you can have an intrusion of igneous rock, and in some cases you get disseminated ore, and in some cases you get a vein deposit. In some cases, uh, the formation of an ore happens near the surface when rainwater leaches, sinks down into the rock and leaches materials and forms a, a, leaves behind other minerals and that forms an ore deposit. Now, I mentioned there, there are many other types. You can precipitate from some from um, metals that come out of, of, uh, of vents on the seafloor and then settle out in the sea, sea surface. Some are, are precipitated out of water solutions we just don't have time to go into all of those today. But I'll point out that, that many ores, at least initially, form an association with igneous rocks. These, remember, are the rocks that form by solidification from a melt. And many of these are formed at conversion plate boundaries. Now, again, I'll, I'll jump back into, into a brief reiteration of plate tectonics. This is a map showing the surface of the Earth and showing that the outer layer of the Earth is broken into a series of plates that move with respect to one another. Here along the East Pacific Rise or along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the plates are moving apart. And there's a lot of igneous activity, and those form certain kinds of ore deposits along mid-ocean ridges. Here along the west coast of South America or along the coast of Japan, down here, you have ocean floors sinking back down into the earth and causing melting, and that forms magmas that rise up into the continental crust, and that forms um, igneous deposits. Sometimes these seafloor deposits get thrust up onto the margins of continents during collisions. In other words, there are lots of different ways in which you can get uh, ore deposits into, into uh, the crust in a place that's accessible. But the point about this is that they, these materials don't occur anyway. They require very special geologic environments in order to form. So let's look at a convergent plate boundary where ocean floors going underneath South America. Here's a, a Google Maps uh, place. South America is moving west, the Pacific Lakes, Pacific Ocean floor is moving east, and they're colliding and the Pacific Ocean floor is sinking back into the mantle. When that plate sinks down, triggers melting deeper in the earth, that produces melt that rises and solidifies in a pluton up near the surface. And if that gets eroded away, um, that can be exposed and can contain ore deposits. The other place along mid-ocean ridges, you have molten material rising up where new ocean floor is forming. That sets up hydrothermal circulation and that can precipitate, that can cause dissolved minerals to, or dissolved ore deposits to form 
and these will settle out on the sea floor. How do you find this ore? Well, uh, in some cases, if you know what you're looking for, there are what are called shows of ore, which are places where the rock is discolored. Uh, it can have a, in the case of copper, for example, it often will have a, a bluish greenish color. And that may be indications that there is an ore present. Uh, in some cases, you look for veins that are cutting across the countryside. Remember, veins are where you have a hot water solution that precipitates in cracks. Um, in the Homestead Gold Mine, one of the biggest gold mines in the world, a lot of the ore occurs in veins. To find it, um, if you have some sort of show, you may drill into the ground and see whether or not, or geologists may drill into the ground and see if there's higher concentrations under the ground that might be worth digging into to find. And in some cases, because ores contain metals and metals are dense, you may have a, a situation um, where you have either a gravity anomaly, where the pull of gravity is a little bit greater, or because ores often contain metallic materials that, that are somewhat metallic, you may have a man magnetic anomaly that indicates that there is an ore underground. But in any case, if you find the ore um, it's, and, and there's a high enough concentration of it, it might be worth mining. So let's look at how that applies to gold, because we're focusing on precious stuff today. So. Gold, of course, is something that became uh, popular for jewelry and for coins, because unlike most metals, it doesn't react with air and water, it doesn't tarnish, it doesn't uh, erode away, it doesn't rust, and it could be worked fairly easily. Where does it occur? Well, there, there are a couple of types of deposits. There are, there are actually three. There are disseminated deposits where the gold occurs in other minerals disseminated through a rock. Then there are uh, um, native metal deposits where the gold occurs as gold metal mixed with other minerals in veins. And then there are places where the gold is eroded away and becomes a sediment sorted by river currents and that accumulates on the floor where it can be mined by, by uh, placer, what's called placer mining, by panning. So here are ore veins, here is ore sediment. Well, the, set, the, the gold that caused the 1849 gold rush of California was originally placer ore. Placer means sedimentary ore, where the ore is mixed in with other kinds of sediment. And when it was discovered in 1848, you know, 100,000 people rushed out there to start panning for gold. And it became quite a legend in, in Western US lore. Um, once that gold began to run, run out, people discovered that there was more gold up in Alaska and miners went rushing up to Alaska to find the ore. In, in Alaska, I'll just mention that the ground was frozen, so they had to use steam to melt the ground in order to abstract, extract the sediment to, to pan it. Um, once the, the bigger companies came in or consortiums of people got together, they began to use dredges to dig up huge amounts of gravel, and then they would pan it inside the boat, dump the gravel in piles along the sides of the stream. You can imagine this isn't the greatest for the stream ecology. Here's an example of one of the giant dredges that was used in, in the Klondike in Alaska and Canada to, to mine ore. These days, uh, individuals will still mine ore using small scale drilling where they basically have a float with a, a, a pump that pumps up water and then runs it through a sluice, separates out the gravel, and concentrates the gold. Uh, in some cases, the, the gold-containing sediment was, uh, had already been deposited and had accumulated in sediment. So they used incredibly powerful hydraulic, uh, high-pressure water jets to break up the alluvium and then pan it. And this, in California, for example, has left a lot of scars in the landscape because they completely dug away everything, leaving behind just bare weathered rock that doesn't grow things very easily. Now, eventually, um, miners tracked the alluvium upstream because remember, alluvium is sediment that's been carried by water and it's precipitated. So they tracked it upstream to find the so-called mother load, which is where the rock was, where the gold was still embedded in solid rock. And in California, that was up here in the foothills of the Sierra Nevadas. And what happened was that, that the gold-bearing igneous rocks 
had sort of plastered onto the continent by subduction and then uh, collisions that brought in blocks of crust and attached them to California. And this is what the gold veins look like, a particularly rich vein of native gold with relatively little quartz because native gold often occurs in association with quartz. So here's the ore veins. Again, the panning for ore. You can see that there are little flecks of gold perhaps. This is what it would look like. There's a tiny little gold nugget and you can extract it, tiny little flakes, bigger flakes. But most of the gold that's being mined today is really low grade. So high grade gold was about eight to 10 grams per ton, about 0 0.3 ounces per ton. Low grade ore, we're talking about ore that's like one to four parts per million. So to mine this ore means taking up huge amounts of crushed rock and then using a process called, I don't even know how to pronounce it, cy cyanidization, well, let's just say reacting it with cyanide. Cyanide is a, uh, an aggressive um, um, material that dissolves out the, the gold and leaves and produces an acidic solution. And then they extract the gold from this solution. But it produces a lot of acid as well. So in order to get rid of that acid, you have to be careful and, and oxidize it. Not always done. What it means is that, that some of the old tailings piles, tailings is the, the waste material left behind by gold mining. Some of the old tailings piles um, are actually now considered to be ore. So there's a road that goes from Durango, Colorado to Silverton, Colorado. And there are places where, except for the fact that it's now the foundation of a highway, uh, if they could dig it up, they would extract it and, and, um, and take gold out of it. So where's mining done today? Well, there are two basic categories of mine, underground mines and surface pit mine, open pit mines. In an underground mine, you dig a shaft and then have tunnels coming off the shaft. You mine the ore and then carry it in elevators back up to the surface or in a road that's been cut underground. Um, here's an example of, of one of the, these, these bodies. Here's the ore body. Sometimes they extracted ore at the surface in the open pit, but then when it gets too deep, it's just not economical to do it. So they have to have an underground mine. It brings up the ore and then they process it. Um, here again, this, the ore body, different levels, extracting it, and then they have a shaft. Old shafts look like this. These are usually abandoned. Modern ones are a lot different. And in an old mine, often they would be they're, they're pretty dangerous places to be in actually because the, the roof could collapse. Um, and so they would support it with wood. Uh, these days they support it with, with steel mesh or with rock bolts. Um, here's an example of a mine. And in, in these days, of course, the mines are usually much bigger operations where they take heavy equipment underground. Usually it's fairly squat equipment because the roofs of the mines are not very high and they extract it that way. And uh, a lot of times the mining is done by drilling and then blasting um, in order to break it up, obviously a lot faster than using a pick. But mines are, are dusty, dangerous places uh, which, which have their own set of problems. For example, if you inhale that dust all day, you can develop a lung disease called silicosis. So it makes sense to wear uh, breathing devices underground. The open pit mines, um, here's an example of a big one and the biggest one in the US, the Bingham Copper Mine in Utah. Here's the, the Hall Road. The, they usually terrace it because it is the easiest way to create the pit while still maintaining stable slopes. Sometimes though that doesn't work. And uh, in Bingham several years ago, there was a huge landslide that caused a large part of the mine to collapse. Fortunately, uh, the mine operators realized that it was about to happen, so they evacuated the mine before this took place, and so there were no casualties. Um, usually, open pit mines start with drilling. You drill holes and then blast in a very specific sequence so that you break up the rock to just the right size so it could be transported. Here's an example of blasting. And then you take the blasted material and put it into, into the subsurface. 
Um, big open pit mines use huge trucks that can carry on the order of up to 200 tons of ore. By comparison, a cement mixer could carry, carries about 70 tons, or the whole cement mixer is about 70 tons. The ore is then crushed and broken up by this process where you have a um, material that just goes up and crushes it into a finer fraction. Then it gets transported to where, where it's processed and then various methods. Uh, I talked about using cyanide solutions. I talked, uh, there are other methods, flotation, grinding. It's complicated me methods to extract the, the valuable metal from the ore. And the, the places where it's done are pretty complex mining operations. You can imagine that part of the reason that mining is so expensive is the huge capital investment that must go into building these, these processing units. Look like this and like this. And unfortunately, uh, some of the processes for extracting ore requires smelting. I don't have time to go into smelting methods, but uh, smelting usually produces fairly acidic fumes, which in the old days before they could be scrubbed or were scrubbed, would, would produce intense acid rain um, that would, would basically devastate the landscape for areas around. Now it's not quite so bad, but it's of course still, still a problem. The other problem is that once the ore minerals are exposed to air, they undergo oxidation. Underground, the ore minerals are in a reduced state. When they get exposed to air, they become oxidized and they dissolve in water and produce acid mine runoff, which often looks something like this. Part of this color is due to the, the, the ore itself, the dissolved minerals themselves, but part is actually due to the bacteria and archaea that live off of that stuff and are, are brightly colored. So when thinking about where stuff comes from, where minerals come from, like gold or copper or any other metals, uh, keep in mind that there is a, a cost involved. They can be disruptive to the landscape uh, in many ways. Here's just as a comparison, I mentioned the Bingham mine and showed you a photograph of it earlier. This is the Bingham mine seen from space. This is Salt Lake City. The Bingham mine is that whole area in there. And these are the tailings piles from the Bingham mine that you can see when you land from in an airplane uh, at the Salt Lake City Airport. Um, it's just an immense amount of change in the landscape. Obviously, um, in context, it's not necessarily that huge, but, but nevertheless, it is a, a large impact. And then there is also the issue of the acid mine runoff and the materials that are used for extracting the, the metals. And then once everything's been done, uh, you have to let the ore solids settle out from the acidic solutions. And these are done in tailings ponds, giant tailings ponds that look something like this, that are held back by dikes. Only problem is that sometimes those dikes fail and then uh, the, the acidic tailings may spread out over quite a bit of a, a, the countryside downstream. So as I thought, I'm not gonna have time to talk about lithium. Uh, I'll see, maybe I'll do that in the next one of these lectures, but I'll just come to a, a conclusion that, that um, maybe the take home message of the, the presentation today is that as with all other um, resources that, that we use in modern society, um, valuable stuff ranging from gemstones to metals, gold, but also copper and iron and other kinds of metals um, all come from the earth. And there's a cost involved in that. Um, there are environmental consequences of extracting it, processing it and using it. Um, and then though I didn't really get into it today, there is a sustainability issue with some of the, these materials, such as rare earth elements and lithium and other kinds of materials, because there are relatively limited supplies. And so I think I'll, I'll leave it at that and I'll, I'll uh, open it up for, for questions from the, the last 10 minutes or so. And hopefully uh, I'll, I'll stop my share and uh, make it so Gillen and others can come on and, and, uh, and talk. You there, Gillen? Well, Gil, I'm not sure if Gillen's there. I'm sure he is, but uh, I just wanted to say thanks a lot. That was uh, highly enlightening, um, f uh, f you know, for a non-scientist like myself, and I really appreciate it. Thus far, we have no questions, so please feel free to uh, uh, fire away with any questions you might have in the Q&A, but uh, uh, pretty interesting topic, and uh, 
you know, uh, I was kind of thinking that uh, um, we think about these things and we think about the expense and we think about, uh, you know, how, how valuable these things can be. And, and uh, a lot of times we miss what other, what the less precious ones might be used for and uh, um, things like that. But also uh, I really appreciated you talking about the sustainability of these things because they're, they're, they do seem to be mostly finite resources. Yeah, they're, they're, they're basically all finite resources, um, some more than others. Um, what, you've, what happens is that, that if you look at the, the usage of materials, you know, it effect, effectively is increasing exponentially. For example, in the case of lithium, which I didn't have a chance to talk about today, uh, its use has gone up exponentially because um, it's now being used for batteries. And the problem is that, that the, the locations where these resources come from is relatively limited. And so uh, to get lithium out of the ground, um, you have to disrupt a lot of the ground. But even once you've done that, you, you're, you're mining progressively lower and lower concentrations until it gets to the point where, where you just, it's just not economical to mine. And so that means that, that for many materials, uh, metals in particular, like copper and aluminum uh, and other materials like that, but also rare earth elements and things that are less, less familiar, um, it becomes extremely important to recycle them. And my guess will be that, that you know, come 100 years from now, the bulk of the materials that we're using are, are going to have to be recycled materials because there's just not going to be a supply of new ones. And it's basically going to be a society that's dependent on, on, on recycling. Excellent. Um, we do have a question um, from Barbara. She asks, are there efforts to make artificial metals such as they do with diamonds? Okay, the uh, question is, can you make artificial metals? And the answer is not really. In fact, no, <laughs> because um, effectively metals are, are elements. And so copper is an element and, and gold is an element. And so it, it's not a matter of what its crystal structure is. It's simply a matter of of uh, is there that material in existence? Now, the only way that you can make one element into another, you know, assuming that alchemy doesn't work, is by by uh, nuclear fusion reactions. And of course, that's that's completely unrealistic for metals. So, really, I think what 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 the question is: Are there other minerals that can be used to extract metals from? And and the answer to that is yes. And so. What it becomes an issue of is whether it's economic or not, because for better or for worse, unless there's a subsidy from, from a government, um, there's no way to, to extract metals from, from common everyday rocks in an economical way. But that may change in the future if energy becomes less expensive. So for example, uh, right now, the, the, the major cost in, in producing metals is energy. And energy has a cost because you're paying an energy company to do it. If there's an unlimited supply of energy, let's say that fusion becomes available as an energy supply, or renewables become so inexpensive that they become, you know, a, a, a basically a, 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 a completely reusable energy supply, then it may be possible to process other and other material, other materials that are lower and lower in concentration. But then you're dealing with the fact that you have to process more and more material to get a diminishing supply of, of the resource you're after. So, so right now, at least in the near term, um, it, it's, it's probably not possible to uh, go to much lower concentrations of ores. And so we're sort of limited in the supply that we get can get. Again, if there's unlimited supply of energy and we can go to the asteroids or go to the moon or other places, uh, you know, as if, which is now only in the realm of science fiction, um, we might be able to, to replace these supplies. But the difference is that diamonds you can replace because that's, that's a common element, carbon, and all you're doing is changing the structure of the mineral. Gold is, is not a common element. And so um, it, it's not a matter of changing the structure. It's a matter of being able to extract it from ores that are less and less uh, rich. Hope that answered your question. Well, thanks very much, Steve. Uh, I see no other questions actually um, at this time. Uh, I, um, 
So at this time, we, uh, yes, and Barbara says, yes, thank you for answering. Um, so at this time, I think we're about to wrap up. Gillen? Yeah, thank you, Tony. And thank you, Steve, very much for a, just a fascinating tour of the, the deep earth and its um, extraordinarily valuable and spectacular treasures that we bring to the surface for our own purposes and delectation. Um, and the sustainability of all that. So uh, now, I, thanks for uh, joining us for this lecture. And I want you to let you know that there is a third lecture in the, the three part four lecture series where st stuff comes from, from uh, Professor Steve Marshak. The third lecture is uh, called Burning Stuff, Fossil Fuels, Consuming the Life of the Past to Power the Life of the Present. That lecture will be on November the 17th, uh, on a Tuesday, November the 17th, again at noon. So please mark your calendars and join us for the third and final lecture from Steve Marshak called Burning Stuff. So signing off for now, for now and thanks very much to everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.